Hey guys, here we are, the Quiggin' Out MMA Podcast, episode 10. I know we've already made it to 10, and I have the distinct pleasure of being joined by the one and only owner, head instructor, black belt, Benjamin Zapata himself. How you doing, sir? Good, good. How you doing, Matt? Not too good bad. To so, I appreciate you taking some time. I know this weekend's huge for you, and we'll talk about that a little bit later, on why that's important, but I wanted to kind of back up and... You know, you being the owner of Gracie Largo now, the school just opened up, I believe, three months ago. Um, you know, how has this this time impacted you, and what have you seen that's kind of uh, gotten you through? And are you glad that it, you know things are back up and running like normal, or at least close? Definitely. Yeah, well, we're definitely glad to be open again. We did uh, we did open on February eighth. We were open. We've actually been open less time than we've been closed. Um, we were open for five weeks and, uh, then we had to close due to the shutdown and we were closed for two months and now we've been open for, I think it's now two, two weeks, just over two weeks. So, uh, we're, we're coming up on our eight weeks here soon being open, but we're plugging along. We're doing great. We've got a lot of students. Um, and you know, as you can see, we're, we're back to, uh, having classes. We have a little bit of a different setup here with the whole squares and everything but we're doing our best to keep up with that and uh looking forward to getting back to normal as soon as possible absolutely and i love that you did the squares um you know because i had the pleasure of being there for that grand opening and it was you know you go to so many gyms and they can clean they can clean they can clean all they want but seeing brand new mats you know just that smell in the atmosphere that was in there um you know seeing those squares now is it weird to have people train within those squares or if it, have they just really adapted um, to what yeah, needs to I be done? Yeah, I was surprised, um, you know, because in the beginning, you know, it was, it was strictly, uh, you know, solo, solo drilling. And, um, and I was surprised that, uh, that most of the people were okay with it. You know, we, we adapted our curriculum to where it, they could do solo movements and, uh, I only taught things that could be done either on a dummy or by yourself. And so, like, people were okay with that, especially our fundamental students who, uh, you know, are new to the sport and the art, and um, they were okay with it. Um, now some of them have even brought in their wives or uh, significant others to train as their training partner. And so that's been interesting because that's been bringing people who may never have even tried it to be very interested in it because we have a, you know, we have a, a fundamental program here that's very uh, uh, first time person friendly. So I think a lot of people when they when they come into a gym like this, they're kind of intimidated. And when they join our program, they're, uh, you know, they feel comfortable about what they're going to learn and how they're going to learn it and not get hurt in the beginning. And, uh, you know, and, and it's been good. It's been good, you know, and, and we're plugging along like you see. Uh, we have we have our social distancing squares behind <laughs> me there, um, you know, and uh, we do our best to, to follow whatever guidelines we're required to follow by the governor. And as soon as we're able to loosen up those guidelines, we will. We're screening everyone and, of course, uh, keeping hygiene top notch, you know. And that's super important. And I love that you touched on the bringing the significant others into the mix because you're right. You know, there's probably a lot of people who had no interest in training and just found that this was something, you know, that they could do because it was open or, you know, somebody else said, hey, you know, we could try this and they can do the solo drills and, like you said, the hygiene. So I think um, once everything starts to open, I think, I hope you would agree, there's going to be a big boom in people joining, um, you know, probably trying out yeah. jujitsu for the first time. Yeah, I think there already has been. I mean, people were locked down for so long and uh, took took for granted the fact that they were able to get out and do things before and then they weren't and then now even even since we've been in the phase full phase one and the phase two people are coming they're signing up like crazy they're coming and taking free trial classes even if it's in the square or not um you know people are dying to do something physical so uh you know hopefully that bodes well for us because we were on a good upslope when we first started mm -hmm. and then we kind of got stopped by the the, the shutdown and uh and hopefully you know hit the ground running again when we when we uh open back up fully but yeah they're coming out for sure and so you know we'll we'll get back to it but you know talk about your journey and how you got started to where you are today because you've not just done jujitsu i know you've had i believe six mma fights 
uh, to mm-hmm. date. You've got a title, and then you even um, do sign language translating for a lot of the media. So I kind of want to see where how all those things got um, combined together and how you got started. So let's let's start from the beginning well, of the sabata. <laughs> well, uh, I'll try to make it short. My dad is deaf. Um, he, he actually he passed last year, but he um, he's the one who I learned sign language from. And when I turned 18, I needed a job. I started interpreting. He was uh, um, an American Sign Language instructor at uh, the university over here, HCC, and, um, and did a lot of in, uh, teaching of interpreters. So I had a good teacher, mm-hmm. and then I ended up picking that as my career, and I've been doing that for 20, 21 years now. Oh, wow. um, full-time interpreting, um, I do... Uh, virtual interpreting through the video, kind of like this. I do on-site interpreting in the courthouse for the media, for the for the sheriff's department, and all of that, as 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 you see on the TV. But um, that you know, that's been my full-time job for a long time. And then, uh, of course, back in the day when I started watching Hoist Gracie, I was like, man, this is cool, and I want to try this out. So I, you know, I found a gym in Tampa, Gracie Tampa, and I, uh, you know, that was a wrap. I just kept 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 going back and kept training and. And for me, I gravitated towards jujitsu more than uh, striking and MMA in the beginning. Um, I thought I wanted to be a mixed martial artist in the beginning, and then I just did jujitsu for a <laughs> long time. Just jujitsu. Uh, it kind of was more conducive with the fact that I had a full time career and didn't want to get punched in the face every day. And, you know, it was a little bit less injury prone than uh, full MMA. <laughs> kind of hard so to do I side language if you got a black eye. So. Yeah, you know, and it's funny because, of course, you can get hurt in jiu-jitsu as well. And I did one time go to a, a big conference that I had to stand up on stage and interpret, and I had a black guy. And uh, that was the first time I had to put uh, makeup on to make sure it didn't look like, you know, I had a giant black eye up on stage. So that was funny. but And that didn't even come from MMA. But in any case, uh, eventually I, uh, I, I started, you know, I was training with a lot of fighters who were – training to fight um, MMA, uh, were training to go to the UFC. You know, um, uh, I was training a lot with uh, current UFC fighters, and um, eventually I decided to take an MMA fight. I went to one of these amateur uh, events, and I said, well, you know, I think I can do this. And uh, my first fight I took, I didn't have very much striking um, experience, but I used basically Gracie Jiu-Jitsu, right? I used <laughs> Gracie Jiu-Jitsu. I took the guy down, submitted him. And then I uh, decided I wanted to train a little bit more, um, stand up, round my game out a little bit, and I uh, kind of got excited about fighting. And the main reason why I decided to fight was to prove that the jiu-jitsu that I had been learning this whole time was effective, um, you know, when someone's trying to actually hurt you instead of just, like, sport, you know what I mean? So, so that's the reason why I started fighting, and, I, you know, I, I didn't start fighting until I was 36 years old. Um, now 39, going on th- 40 years old here, com- mm-hmm. coming up soon. In November, and, uh, right? Yeah, in November I'll be I'll be 40. It's crazy, <laughs> you know. Um, but I do I do plan on fighting ag- again. You know, I I, I want to take a couple more fights. Um, right now I'm focused on uh, the gym that we've been opening up, me and my girlfriend Jen. Um, but but I do plan on uh, taking another couple fights before I uh, call it quits. You know. And I mean that was that was a lot all wrapped into one. So. You know, we can focus on the, the last portion of it. Like you said, you didn't take your first fight until you were 36. You know, a right. lot of fighters, they're kind of on the downswing on that. You'll see some exceptions um, where guys are just performing well beyond their, you know, what they should be um, in the societal views. So why, you know, at 36, were you like, am I too old for this? Or did you just say, I'm good, I know what well, I'm doing, and you had been competing for a while, so... Right, right. You know, I mean, I, I, I'm an avid competitor. I've competed a lot, and so I try to keep myself in, in the best shape that I can. And then the main reason why I think I had the confidence to do that is just because I joined uh, MMA in the amateur ranks, and I was already a brown belt in jiu-jitsu. And so I felt like my jiu-jitsu was uh, far beyond what the other amateurs who were fighting, they had a lot better striking than me, don't get me wrong. And there's a, there a lot of tough guys in the amateur ranks. Um, they're not easy fights, but I, I, I felt very confident in my jiu-jitsu in the fact that I could uh, try to minimize the damage 
you know, um, I did get hurt once in, in one of my fights, um, but it was my own doing. I hit the cage and split my head open, and, you know, that was, that was pretty bloody. But uh, I did end up winning that fight, luckily. But um, I try to minimize damage, you know. I'm not, I'm not one of those guys who's going to go out there and just uh, throw hands and just, like, pummel each other for five rounds. Um, you know, I try to be a little bit smarter of a fighter than that. Um, of course, because I'm a little older, I don't have the uh, luxury of, you know, just taking all that damage and bounce it back. So, you know, I got to be smart about it. Um, really? But I want, I, I don't want to, I don't want to, um, I guess I don't want to waste the opportunity, you know, while I still have the opportunity to try to fight, uh, I want to get out there, um, you know, check it off my bucket list and, uh, you know, improve that the jujitsu works. And and then you know I'll go on to on to different things as soon as my body starts breaking down you know. <laughs> well, and, and you talk about you know being a brown belt going into amateur ranks and that is incredibly like incredibly unusual for an amateur fighter to go into at that point. And I mean, three out of your four wins. It's, I'm sorry, one, two, three, four out of your five wins were jokes. So that jujitsu is still there. Yeah. <laughs> it's all about jujitsu for me, you know. I uh, uh, there's a couple other guys who are uh, higher belts, and one of my the only win that I didn't win with jujitsu was against a brown belt as well. And uh, and I trained extensive striking for that uh, with Crew Dan Rawlings. I, I man, I spent so much time training striking with him Muay Thai. And um, and was fortunate enough to get a knockout in that fight, which was very exciting for me <laughs> as a jujitsu guy, you know. But um, I think but I was yeah. there for that one. Yeah, I think I was there yeah. for that one. <laughs> that one's fun, you know. He's a good guy, uh, Mr. Robus. He's a real, real good guy. His whole family's uh, super awesome. I appreciate that fight. And I think that's uh, something most of the people who are not in the MMA community, you know, community, not in the jujitsu community, don't understand is that you guys can fight, and then you could be still be friends afterwards. Like you, like you said, you yeah. know the guy's whole family. You know, it's. Yeah, I'm, 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 you know, as long as they respect me, I respect them. And I'm, you know, mo most of the guys who I compete against and fight against, I'm, I'm very good friends with. Um, you know, some of them are a little immature and, and, and want to, you know, hold a grudge. But, you know, I don't hold a grudge against anyone. I'm, you know, I'm not, I'm not one of those guys who talk a bunch of smack online or even in person. You know, if you want to fight, we fight. And if, and then after it's done, you know, it is what it is. And, you know, I keep moving forward and keeping positive. I, that kind of stuff doesn't really, like, uh, motivate me to fight. You know, that's not what motivates me. Some people have to hype themselves up with uh, negativity, but that's not really what motivates me, so. No, and I think that brings a good point to, you know, when you did your, your grand opening, I want you to talk about that day, like, how exciting that was, and talk about some of the things you did, because I know you were giving, you know, lessons to, you know, like, first responders, um, and police officers, and I feel like in today's age, you know, that was a few months ago, that was four months ago, um, how beneficial that could be. So how did that come about, and what was your first day like, um, in your eyes, just seeing your vision come to life? Well, uh, we we're very excited to have found this awesome location. You know, it was uh, impossible to pass up. You know, we uh, got a great deal on it and, um, you know, put a lot of work into this place. So when we were finally able to uh, open, of course, it was like super exciting. I had my family fly in and a lot of friends, a lot of friends came out and supported, you know, you were there. Um, and, and, and the reason why we uh, kind of made a big deal about um, first responders and made, excuse me, first responders and made the, the seminar on that day kind of geared towards them was because there are a lot in this area. I mean, of course I support, uh, police, firemen, and uh, first responders, the military, um, a strong supporter of them. But the, there's the, the jail is right up here. The police station is right here. Um, we have tons in the area, and I want. I think it's very important that they know to how to you know know jujitsu. I mean, it's it's very important. You know, you can go on on and on about you know whether or not if they know it or if they don't. Personality types and everything, but. In general, if you train jiu-jitsu and you train um, for the martial arts way of jiu-jitsu, which is to learn patience, respect, and uh, humility, then that's going to help you in any aspect. And whether you're, you know, a lawyer, a uh, sign language interpreter, you know, a uh, podcast guy, um, you know, uh, 
uh, or a first responder or law enforcement. And we, we are lucky enough to have a lot of um, first responders trained with us, uh, police officers and, and the like. Um, as well as everyone else, and and we all get along, and um, you know I think it's very important to just share it with everyone. There's you know all demographics need it, in my opinion. I mean there's not there's not anyone that you can point out where I won't say yeah that person need, needs jujitsu. You know I'm obviously a jujitsu fan, so I think <laughs> everyone needs jujitsu, and uh, I think if you train it correctly with the right mindset, then it should improve your life overall. You know I know I've improved from the beginning where I was out of shape. I was you know, possibly uh, not not along the right path. And every every day, I, just like when you try to tr- improve your jujitsu, you try to improve your life and the way you behave and and the way you see things. So I think that's very important, you know. And yeah. so for 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 police officers, it's very important. Very yeah, important. and absolutely. And you know, knowing the the benefits of jujitsu and it not just being a physical aspect, like you said, it kind of sounds like it kind of saved you from something else. Um, you know, yeah. I mean, well, you know, I was I was out of shape. I was eating wrong. I, you know, I I was just completely off track of what I could reach of, of my own potential. You know what I mean? And and as long as you're able to um, notice the fact that you make mistakes and you you know you, you you sometimes you do the wrong things. If you can notice that and change it, then that's the only thing that matters. I mean, I, I think that people can change. And, you know, whether it's healthy, changing or changing healthily, changing mentally, um, changing your mindset, uh, whatever it is, you know, or just changing your jujitsu. Some people get in a rut where they're like, well, I know jujitsu. This is a jujitsu that I do. And they don't evolve. And so you got to keep evolving no matter what it is in your life and, and, and be open to improving. Right. And so that's what I think jujitsu has helped me do with my own life. And I want to continue to spread that to other people, even though it's not easy always talking to people who are a little resistant to that. They just want to learn jujitsu, how to choke someone, and that's it. And they don't want to change their mindset. But it's very important to have the right mindset, I think. You know. And I love that you brought that up because it is a mindset thing. Because you know, a lot of white belts will never make it to blue belt. They just they give up. They don't have you know. They don't change the mindset. They're just focused on. You know, why am I not learning? Why am I not learning? Why is it not working? And, right. you know, I'll never forget probably about six, eight months ago, training with somebody, another white belt, and he just said, I'm not learning anything. I'm getting choked out every five seconds. And I looked at him and I said, you got to really think about every second you're spending on that mat, you're learning something. And he just right. looked at me like I was insane. And I remember seeing him two weeks later and he went, you were right. He's like, now I'm out there 10, 15 seconds. And I said, sometimes you got to build those smaller, you know, goals. You can't just say, I'm going to go into jiu-jitsu. I'm going to be a black belt. It's a long road. Yes. Yeah. Um, and, so- you know, so, like you said, smaller goals, um, you know, bite-sized chunks. Sometimes you say, well, I want to, uh, you know, just survive a little bit longer. You know, that's a win. You know, when you're getting tapped out multiple times, that's a win. You know, as a white belt, I think it's important <clears throat> to focus on. Uh, I think it's important to focus on learning as much technique as you can, and instead of always running to roll, which rolling's fun, and if you have good rolling partners, very respectful rolling partners that help you learn, then that's okay. But there's a lot of guys out there and a lot of schools out there. They just throw each other to the to the wolves. You guys just roll. You get smashed. You get discouraged. And then you quit. And so I, so what we're doing here at uh, Grace T. Largo is we're, our fundamentals class, um, in the beginning, there's no rolling. There's no rolling. And, and so we're, we're, I want everyone to learn a position from every, every uh, or excuse me, uh, some kind of technique from every position, mm-hmm. as well as have a confidence in the fact that they, when they get to a position, they're going to know something to do and they're going to know self-defense because we don't only do self uh, sport here. We do self-defense as well. And then once they feel comfortable, then we start getting into more uh, live, live drilling and then eventually live rolling. But I was thrown to the wolves in the very beginning and I got hurt multiple times and I could have gotten discouraged, but I'm maybe too stupid and I just kept going. <laughs> I just kept uh, covering. I just kept going back. And lo- luckily, I was able to persevere through. But um, we're, we're trying to help more people learn and more people feel uh, encouraged to continue to learn because 
jujitsu is a lifetime thing. And if you focus on all the hard stuff in the beginning, like getting killed and, and, and you know, get, getting beat up and all that stuff, it discourages you and you lose the opportunity to be training for a lifetime. So even if in the beginning you're like, man, I want to roll, well, if you just sit down and focus on your technique and you develop a strong foundation of jiu-jitsu first, then you're going to be able to roll for the rest of your life and it'll be worth it. You know, that's, a, that's a, at least how I look at it. Yeah, and you get it all the time with the, the higher belts that go, ah, you can't be tired. I'm 20 years older than you. And I'm like, I hope I can roll like you in 20 years. <laughs> right, exactly. It's all it's a long game, bro. It's a long game. So, like, sometimes people see the short, the short stick and it's like you got to look at the long game, work on those little goals, you know, little, little longer surviving here, uh, communicate, you know, ask – Film your roles. A lot of a lot of people don't film their roles, and it's not about filming it to post it on Facebook. It's about filming it so that you can sit down with a higher belt, or so that you can watch and be like, "Man, I keep getting caught in that move. Maybe I should ask somebody about that move." And then, boom, you level up right there. You know? Yeah, and I remember when I when I first like decided I was going to commit to it. I remember every time I got mount, there was a brown belt who would sweep me. And he, he did it to me probably about 10 times throughout the course of a few weeks. And one day he finally said, do you know how I'm doing that, right? I said, I have no idea. And he goes, you're leaning to the left. He goes, and you do it three times every time. He goes, and by the third time, I've got your weight. So I remember rolling with him the next time. And I did the left. I did the left. And as I saw him go to base, I went to the right. And I passed. And he went, good. And for me, that was a win. Whether anything happened from it, and I think, like you said, those little goals, you know, everybody wants to be a jiu-jitsu champion, you know, you, you've got those lofty goals, whether you want to admit it or not, you know, you want right. to be really, really Good. proficient at it, yeah. Lofty goals, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I know rolling with you was incredible, because it was the speed and the um, the technique that was there, and I think that was one of the important parts, is you don't always have to be faster, and use it too. You don't have to be stronger. You just have to be smarter. Right. Yeah. Then that's what drew me to jujitsu. Is that it was more of a mental game for me when I started. Man, I could call myself a nerd, whatever you want to call it. You know, when I was in high school, I was all you know honors classes, nerdy kind of guy. I didn't hang out with the you know the the jocks or anything like that. It wasn't very um, I wasn't very athletic or uh, mm-hmm. you know sportsy. And so when I tried jujitsu, it, it kind of was like a puzzle to me. And, and so I realized that even if, I, if I'm a little bit smarter or I think a little bit more, then I can beat the big athletic guys. You know what I mean? And so that's what makes me, <clears throat> uh, that's what makes me excited when someone comes in who is unathletic and who is shy and timid, and, and they're, but they're smart. Powering off. Excuse me, but they're smart, and <laughs> and uh, and then you can teach that person to become a monster. And you know, as long as you don't discourage them in the beginning, and set them off and let, have them get beat up for you know the first five weeks, as long as you teach them to be smart about their jujitsu, man, they're going to become a monster. And then you know they're going to have so much confidence in the future. I, I think that's what's very important about. I see jujitsu as a game, like a video game. I always try to beat the next level. Always trying to beat the next level, you know? So I love that you've adapted it because for the most part, they've called it human chess because you always have to be thinking ahead, but you literally adapted it to nowadays where you're like, all right, I got to beat the next level. I got to beat the next level. So yeah, it's like every time you get swept, it's like you're in a video game and that boulder keeps rolling down the hill and keeps smashing you, you know? And then, every, and then the next time you go through that level, you're going to stop and let the boulder fly by. And then you're going to keep going. And then finally you beat that level. And then the next level is even harder. <clears throat> that's exactly how I see it. And just while we're on that topic, no gi is the game and gi is the extended map pack of the game. Right? <laughs> so, you know, it, it's just more stuff to do. It's, uh, it's not a, you know, it's not a different game. It's the same game, but it's a lot more stuff to do. It's the expansion you know? pack. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. I love it. You know? And that's that's the important part too, is because people think that a lot of jujitsu is only gi, so having the no gi aspect, so bringing those two together, um, you know, I'll watch the guys go from gi to no gi in the gym, and it's it's amazing to see the different 
techniques they have to use, the different mindset you have to have, other than being able to grab somebody's lapel. Right. Yeah, I'm. I'm totally not uh, a supporter of the ar- argument of one is better than the other. I love doing both. You know, I, I. I. I think I'm better at one than the other just because of how I started, but which was in no gi. Mm-hmm. I started doing more no gi, but I've trained so much gi up till this point that. Man, I love both. I do. And in my school, we do it half and half. And, and you know, I encourage everyone to know both because it's, it's not one or the other. Well, and you go back to the self-defense technique. Again, if you're out in the street, you're, you're hoping they, you know, if they have something to hold on to. But if they don't, that's where that no-gi could really come into effect and, you know, potentially save your life. Yeah, yeah. It was, you know, once someone grabs your, your jacket that you have on and you don't, feel normal someone grabbing you you're just not ready you know to just pull your arm out because you're sweaty and your arm slips out that's not realistic sometimes you know you have to be able to control someone with their clothes not be controlled with your own clothes and then if you're on the beach and you guys have board shorts you can fight still too you know? <laughs> i feel like you're talking from experience is there a story behind that no no i i haven't i haven't fought out on the street since i started jiu-jitsu i might have had a couple scuffles when i was younger but since i started jiu-jitsu it's only been sanctioned mma fights you know i i've learned a lot of patience with jiu-jitsu i'm sure there have been times i could have you know done something but i i haven't i haven't smart, <laughs> smart answer <laughs> but I kind of want to talk about, you know, doing the sign language as a full-time job. Like, did you tell them up front or did they, you know, obviously you've been doing that for 21 years. Um, You know, what was the reaction when somebody somebody who didn't know you, that's what you did on the side, found out as far as you being jujitsu and doing MMA? Yeah, it's, it's interesting because, you know, with my sign language interpreting job, um, I've been doing it for a long time, and um, a lot of the jobs that I do are confidential. They're just confidential, so I can't I can't talk about them. And and so with my Facebook, basically all I post is jujitsu stuff, you know. <laughs> and so people just see me as a jujitsu guy. But I have a full time job, you know. I still do it part time now, even though I'm owning I own this business. I still interpret part time, and. Um, and, and that's, you know, I went full-time job and I would go after in the evenings and I would train jiu-jitsu and on my lunch break, I would train jiu-jitsu. And <laughs> if I got up early enough in the morning, I would train jiu-jitsu and then I would go to my job. The only risk was is that if I hurt my hand or my finger or my arm, that's costing me money and I can't work. So jiu-jitsu was a risk to my job, which is, you know, part of the reason why I want to open my own academy. You know, I, I, I think it's uh, not only is it my passion, but... Um, you know, I, it's a little bit more of a, a life insurance policy for me. Um, I, I continue to love my job as an assigned language interpreter. And uh, anytime I have available to go and do it, like the other day when I was called by the mayor and the chief of police to go and do that, I was available. I'm happily willing to go do that. I enjoy uh, doing that service. And, and, and you know, it's a, it's a job that I enjoy. So um, a lot of people don't know it about me because I don't post a lot about it. Um, but, but it's very, very big part of me. Sign language was the first language that I learned. My dad is deaf. And, uh, when I was a little baby, that's the first language I learned. So it's actually more, I'm more comfortable signing than I am speaking. So, you know, uh, you know, if I were to be able to do this podcast in sign language, it would be a lot more comfortable for me. Really? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. That's that's pretty amazing. I, and I know that you had never posted about it, and I had known you for years, you know, on and off through the scene. And I remember watching a press conference, and I went, I just yelled Zapata at the screen. And my girlfriend went, what? And I was like, I know that guy. Like, he fights. And she just kind of looked at me, and I just remember thinking, oh, okay, you know, I want to talk to him about that. And I think that's, that is exciting, because it being your first language and you not being deaf um, is, doesn't happen very often. Um, right. so I, uh, my dad was a large part of the deaf community. And, uh, now that I'm saying that I, I feel like I should have been signing this whole podcast because there's a lot of my friends who are going to go back and be like, yo, what were you saying the whole time you weren't signing? Um, but you know, well, I, I, if they ask me, I'll, I'll have to go back and interpret the whole thing. <laughs> but yeah, when, when I'm on TV and stuff like that, that kind of 
stuff is public uh public record so i'm allowed to talk about that i'm allowed to share it a little bit mm -hmm. um but uh but most of the stuff i do is, is private and confidential so I, i'm not allowed to talk about it and so i just don't make a big deal about my job and then um and, but uh, but I I enjoy it and I, I know a lot of deaf people a lot of deaf friends um, I have actually a couple deaf guys um, purple belts who are coming to train in my gym this coming up week probably Monday and Tuesday they're coming to train in my gym and uh, I'm looking forward to that because uh, you know there's a large contingent of deaf people who um, to do jujitsu. Um, a couple black belts out there, you know, there's a black belt in Texas. His name is Garrett. He's a real cool guy. And he got me hooked up with this whole online, um, Facebook community of deaf people who do jujitsu. And, uh, so I've gotten to travel around and meet a lot of those guys and, um, teach a couple people who, uh, who do jujitsu in, in sign language as well. So that's cool. And you I, know, I, that's I, awesome. I hope to add those kind of classes and have more deaf, uh, members in my, in my gym in the future. So how do you, what's the, the biggest challenge then, um, helping somebody train, you know, are you signing? Is it more of a kind of a hands-on experience or kind of like, yeah, I mean tell? like, so I'll start signing right now. So I'm signing at the same time as I'm speaking. So it's called SimCom and it's not exactly the same as me signing without speaking, but I can sign and talk at the same time. And then when I'm teaching someone how to train, then it's more of like, well, just watch what I'm doing, and then I'll explain it after my hands are free because jujitsu, obviously, my hands are going to be busy, you know, choking someone out or whatever. So I have to show the move first, and then second, sit down and, and explain what happened instead of talking at the same time. So it's a little bit different, um, but it can be done, and it's, uh, I'm, you know, I, I have done it before, and I look forward to doing it again in the future, you know. And, and I don't think, I, not that I've ever seen it, that anyone's ever signed during an interview. So this is super cool. You know, not to, I think Matt Hamill probably would have been the last example that everybody knew. Um, yeah. Like, that's really One, amazing. He's, he's a friend of mine, too. You Even know, cooler. Matt Hamill. Yeah. So with that being said, you know, like you said, you're explaining it. Do you feel like it's a little bit, they're a little bit more receptive um, when you're able to, you know, like you said, you have to, to sign it. And then you have to show. Do you feel like they get an extra advantage in that sense because they're not really focused on anything else but exactly what you're doing? Um, I don't know if it's an advantage, but I know for sure that they've had a disadvantage for a long time. Like they go to schools. There's a lot of deaf people out there in MMA schools around the country who are sitting there in class and watching, and all they see is the person, the, the instructor's mouth talking, and then the instructor's doing something. But their mouth is saying, don't do this. And you're just seeing them do something. So you're like, well, maybe that's what I'm supposed to do. Mm -hmm. And the instructor saying, don't do this, do this. And then you're like, I don't really know, but I saw two things and I've got to figure it out. And they're very, very focused on what they're supposed to do. And then, you know, they could communicate with people afterwards and stuff like that. There was a deaf guy who trained with us over at Rob Khan's gym. His name is Jay. He's actually very good friends with Matt Hamill. And, um, he, uh, I would interpret for him sometimes in class. He had an MMA fun fight one time, and I was, you know, I, I was very uh, early into jujitsu at that time. But I was interpreting it. I was able to get into the ring uh, in the, as his corner with uh, with his coach Rob uh, to interpret between Rob and him during the middle of the two uh, rounds. You know what I mean? But during the round, there's no coaching because mm -hmm. you can't look at your coach and fight at the same time. So it's all you. You know, so, you know, it, it's definitely, I would call it more of a disadvantage, but it's a disadvantage that they overcome and continue to, to keep coming. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And I, and I like that, that you, you know, you kind of flip the script there because you turn it around because it is a disadvantage that they've dealt with. they almost, you know, a lot of them their entire lives. And like you right. said, they're seeing someone say, don't do this. And then right. they do it and they're trying to figure it out. So I love that you're bringing a different aspect to jujitsu that, um, maybe not a lot of people understand is even a need. Um, right. You know, and there's probably a lot in the deaf community who want to train but haven't been able to find, like you said, haven't been able to find somebody uh, to really take that time and, you know, accommodate and make sure, you know, let them feel that this is something they could do regardless of anything that they're dealing right. with. Right. No, there's a couple of MMA gyms out there where the instructors are very understanding and they don't just – 
teach the way that they normally would teach. If they have a deaf person in the room, maybe they'll be doing this and they'll say, don't do this, do this, yes, you know. And if they don't know sign language, they're at least doing a little bit of pantomime to help out and bridge the gap. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I applaud those guys because even if they don't know sign language, they're, they're trying to, to include the person who, um, who doesn't hear. Yeah, absolutely. So moving right along, um, mainly, you know, sorry, that was super cool having you sign. Um, <laughs> you know, in the, my, my Best Buy days, I had a few customers who were deaf, and they would come over to me and they write stuff down. And I made sure, you know, that we write it back down and make sure you make eye contact. And I had one lady, she goes, I'm deaf, but I can see you. And I didn't know what that meant at first. And as I was right. talking to her, she was like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And she was right. reading my lips the whole time. Yeah, um, um, some of some of de some deaf people can read lips very well. Some cannot, and even the ones who can, they're not getting one hundred percent. So when you know, you got to do your best, and, and and you know, and and luckily, I've learned to read lips a lot just being a sign language interpreter and being around deaf people. But mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, as long as people try to communicate with each other and, and, and be open-minded, then, you know, that's the most important thing. Well, she taught me probably the most important thing I've ever learned, and you'll have to explain this in sign, what I'm doing. Um, she said, make sure that when you say thank you, that you don't right. say thank you. <laughs> right, exactly. Exactly. That would, that would be one of those, uh, you know, Italian, mm. you know, F off kind of kind of things. And she used to know? laugh every time she saw me because I'd make sure to, like, you know, do that. And while that's the only thing I know, it's it's come in handy. We've have Instacart shoppers who come by and they'll they'll point at their ear and they'll immediately, you know, I'll understand what's going on and I'll go, Thank you and you just see their face light up and I go, Sometimes yeah. that's all it takes. Yeah. Yeah, at least that you're trying, right? Yeah, exactly. The other one is the other one is the word morning. Morning. So you wanna do it like this instead of with a closed fist. You know. Open fist. Morning. Oh, okay. Yeah. okay. <laughs> Yeah, because that could be uh, construed the wrong way. If you had paid me a million dollars before this, that I would learn some sign language during an interview, I'd probably, <laughs> I'd probably be a, a million dollars uh, out of my pocket. So that was pretty awesome. So thank you for that. For um, sure. Let's talk about this weekend because, you know, as most people, if they don't know, Jits King has selected, you know, your gym to be the, you know, the host for the middleweight tournament. It's a five thousand dollar prize on the line, and I know a lot of their literature still says to be determined or undisclosed locations. So, how did it come about that you were the selection, and how exciting is that for you, being that your gym has only been open, you know, on and off for four months? Right. Um, well, we're excited to have it happen for sure. Um, I think this this is uh, uh, the reason why they chose this location might be a couple reasons, but. Um, I mean, this place is awesome, man. I mean, you come out, <laughs> this place is awesome. I mean, this is, I, I, I bought this place and we built this place to be my dream come true as a, as a jiu-jitsu uh, practitioner. And of course, I want the people who come in, the members, to enjoy it and feel at home. And, you know, if you come into this place, it's awesome. We continue to improve. This wall, where uh, this wall is still blank, but we're gonna have more stuff up here. We're gonna keep decorating. We have the, you know, we have the mats here. We have, let's see if I can angle this right. We have the weight room over there. Mm -hmm. The we have the the, the changing rooms. Um, super nice front lobby, and um, and up there. Where, where, where? <laughs> yeah, I do the same thing. I'm like up here. That uh, that view from up there is is awesome. So. You know, of course, the shots this weekend are going to be great. Flow Grappling is going to get some awesome shots. Um, I'm going to be commentating as well as hosting. You know, so for the past two Jits Kings, I have had the pleasure to commentate with Patrick Hamilton the third. Uh, we sat next to each other and commentated the past two uh, Flow uh, Jits Kings on Flow Grappling. I'm going to hopefully continue to do that, and uh, I'll be commentating whether it's up there or over here or wherever we end up sitting. It'll probably be over here somewhere, um, but I'll be commentating. I'm, I'm happy to be hosting it. I think this venue is uh, a good venue. It's close you know, to, the, to the airport, close enough to the airport where people can uh, fly in and, uh, 
and and we're super excited to be hosting it it's obviously going to bring some attention to the gym and um and, and you know we want to keep keep the ball rolling you know we're we're in this to to be here for the future you know we're not going anywhere yeah and, and with florida doing the phase two last week um you know kind of opening everything up i know this originally was supposed to be a spectator spectator less event wow that is a that's a kicker of a word. A, so, <laughs> yeah. so from what I understand, they are selling limited tickets, a limited number of tickets uh, for the event, which is pretty exciting given, um, you know, you're hosting the first big event here. Um, yeah. It's one of the first tournaments that's back since the shutdown. So does that mean a little bit more to you, knowing that uh, it's going to bring that many more eyes? And like you said... Uh, yeah. It was uh, it was a last minute thing for the spectators, so it's kind of we're scrambling here. I mean, I am. They're they're taking care of their part. Um, they're the organizers of the event, and they are selling fifty tickets, I believe, um, on Eventbrite. So if you're looking for tickets, go to Eventbrite. Um, I don't have the tickets, but um, contact Jets King and everything. Grab your tickets. Otherwise, um, watch it on Flow Grappling because. You know the shots will be amazing, and you can always come in later and check out the check out the venue. But um, if you are interested in coming seeing in person, um, check out Eventbrite. Uh, or if you can't find that information, contact me, and I'll point you in the right direction. But we're excited to host it here. Um, we're going to be screening people. You know, just like we've been doing um, uh, for for our members and our people training. Don't come here if you're sick. I don't care if you paid a hundred dollars for the for the ticket. Sell it to somebody, all right? If you're sick, do you have a fever, and you come here and I strain your head, I'm going to ask you politely to leave because we don't want anyone getting sick. It's, uh, you know, the one thing, positive thing that we could say came from this whole pandemic is that people should continue to be and improve their um, consideration of others when they're sick, whether it be the flu, whether it be whatever. Just stay home when you're sick, man. You know what I mean? And and so we, we're going to have a good event. We're going to have all the precautions taken. And, uh, and, and you know, we're looking forward to it. You know, we're getting amped up this whole week, um, making sure the place is ready. And uh, we'll have, some, you know, some snacks in the front for people to purchase. And, uh, and then, of course, a couple seats for people to sit in. And this place is going to be decked out on Friday night. And we're looking forward to it. Well, and yeah, and you have something, you know, from what I can see, Starts at six on Saturday, uh, goes until ten thirty. You know we've got a sixteen man tournament, which was invite only. Uh, I mean, it really just adds even more allure uh, to the event itself, being that this, these aren't just people who are signing up, and you know this is going to be some of the the most high level people probably in the world. Yeah, that packet's awesome, man. I, I was I, I accepted the uh, the opportunity to host it before I even know about the bracket. But then when I saw the bracket, man, I'm super excited because that bracket's going to be fireworks, and and I don't even know who's going to win, but it's going to be exciting. Is there anybody in particular that you're you're thinking is going to win, or anybody that you've been like you're keeping an eye on? Man, they're all good, but I know that the last couple Jits Kings, the Tacket Boys, have been killing it, you know, and and so you can't pat, you know, you can't overlook the Tackets, Baby Monster, you know, you got, I mean, everybody on that card is good. There's a couple people in there I don't know, but I don't underestimate anyone. I do know, however, historically speaking, the Tackets have been killing it. And they're, they they obviously have something, some formula dialed in right. So I would watch out if I was everybody else and, and take them seriously. So how do you feel about, you know, hopefully this is going to be a marker really for, well, the hat came off. <laughs> but... It's going to be a marker for hosting future events, so obviously that's something you'd want to do in the future, correct? Oh yeah, we uh, we considered that when we when we open this place. You know, we're going to be hosting more events here. Um, you know, if someone wants to reach out to us and, and talk about stuff in the future, we're open to that. We have our own um, plans in the works. You know, like you said, we've only been open. We're like an infant when it comes to being open. So, you know, we're just still trying to get stuff off uh, stuff on the walls and, and everything painted and everything like in order. You know, I mean, every day we're still fixing stuff up. Um, but, but that doesn't mean we don't have plans for the future. We're definitely hosting events here. We're going to host tournaments. We're going to host invitational events. And, uh, and this is going to be the venue to go to. I mean, there's not very many 
gyms out there, definitely not in this area that have um, the, the square footage and and the, the view of the mat that we have. Mm-hmm. So That's I'm definitely fortunate. definitely unique, yeah. Yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, there's a lot of awesome gyms out there. Don't get me wrong. They got awesome gyms. They got good teachers, awesome students, awesome competitors, good mat space. But, I mean, you just got to come and see this place, you know. And I love that because, you know, you being – you are a black belt and your gym is a white belt essentially it's in the beginning stages it's being molded it's overcoming those new challenges those new hurdles so for you what what has been the biggest hurdle to overcome other than the the obvious shutdown because i don't know anybody that was excited for that so yeah you got me on that i was quickly gonna say the easiest challenge was man the shutdown because we were like man let's get this thing running we were working hard and then boom put on the brakes and so we had to we had to pivot we uh we started teaching zoom classes online um you know i was teaching zoom classes out of my house while i let this thing just sit here unused uh that was super sad time but in the meantime we 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 didn't just um sit idle we put a lot of work into uh into the gym into the curriculum into the programs that we um are already implementing when we came back so um that was challenging but it was it was a it was a room for growth and so that was awesome and so now um what's challenging is well the electric bill that's one (laughs) right the electric bills uh you know not going to be cheap in a place like this but um i mean everyone's very nice you know all of our students are our members are awesome um I, I can't say anything bad about it. I love coming here every day. I'm here all day, every day. And, uh, and and I enjoy all the members. I enjoy teaching the kids' classes. That's something that I didn't teach before. I have a 20-year-old son. And, I, you know, my ex-wife had a couple of boys. And so I've raised kids. But, but I've never taught kids' classes jiu-jitsu. And so now that we have kids here, man, I'm enjoying it. We have awesome kids. They're loving it, and uh, you know I can't say enough good things about all the members. So, um, I, and I'm very lucky to have my girlfriend Jen by my side. Otherwise, I wouldn't be able to do this by myself. No, nope, you know? and that's actually what I was going to talk about next: is how how crucial has it been to have Jen at your side? Because as long as I've known you, basically, she's been right there, and it's usually not even more than five feet away. Like it doesn't right. matter where you are. She's not following you, but she's always close by going, okay, are we doing what we need to be doing? Um, so yeah, how important is it? She's on top of everything. You know, um, you know, we make a great partnership. Um, she's very intelligent. She's, uh, she's got, you know, degrees. She's got lots of sales experience, lots of psychology experience. She's, she's, uh, you know, like I said, if I, if I didn't have her, I would still open my school, but it wouldn't be this size. You know, it would be a lot smaller, and I would have to start my start a little bit, you know, smaller and work my way up and learn the ropes business-wise. Uh, you know, I have a little bit of my own, but man, without her, uh, I wouldn't be where I was. So, so uh, we're, we definitely make a great team, and you know, you know, I love her a lot. She's 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 great. And again, when you were doing the the Zoom classes, you know, it was crazy because I'd watch some of those, and having your partner be your girlfriend and be there right there and be able to do a lot of that. Do you feel like that yeah. helped you guys kind of what grow? Would I do, what would I do if I'm sitting at home without someone to demonstrate moves on? You know what I mean? Um, you know, she was there as, as my training partner. She's there here as my business partner. And, uh, and, and yeah, yeah, it's, a, it's definitely a, a blessing that I have her. Yeah, absolutely. And I wanted to give Jen that shout out just because I've seen her mm-hmm. run around um, especially the grand opening. I don't think she sat still for more than 30 seconds. Uh, she she rarely does sit still, you know. We both are always on the move, and that's what makes us, uh, you know, go where we go is because, you know, although we enjoy relaxing just as much as the next person, we, you know, we're always doing moving and doing something, and, and, uh, and she doesn't stop, you know. Absolutely. So for anyone who has no jujitsu experience for – you know, somewhat, you know, what would be the enticement for you to say, you know, the kind of the encouraging words to stick with it? Like, what would you have to say to somebody, you know, who may be out there going, yeah, you know, I was off for two months and now I feel like I've forgot everything. So what would you say to somebody, you know, in a position like that? Well, 
first of all, they probably turned off the ca- off the camera a long time ago if they have no experience. But uh, hopefully they're still with us because they're going to look for some insight. All right, and that's great. Um, so what I would say to them is, number one, keep at it, but find uh, find a place where you feel like you're learning. Find a place where you feel like le- you're learning. And, and like you said about the small goals, don't try to take everything at once. You know, when you set your goals too high and, and, and you don't reach them in the, in the certain amount of time, you got to set reasonable goals, right? And, 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 and make, your, make your progress that way. Sometimes you see people out there and like that meme where it's like the iceberg and there's all this work underneath. All you see is the tip of the iceberg. You know, people didn't get there by doing nothing. You know, the winners didn't get there by by winning everything. Most of them didn't. Mm-hmm. You know, there, uh, there's a couple outliers there. But for the majority of us, and myself included, I'm a slow learner. I got injured a lot in the beginning. I got frustrated a lot in the beginning. When I went and did, started doing tournaments, it was probably too early for me to do them. And I lost a lot, <laughs> a lot in the beginning. I lost a lot. You know, you go back into my white and blue belt days, and all you see is Ben losing. And then eventually, uh, and then eventually, I started to pick it up. And so, you know, it will it will pick up. You just gotta hang in there and don't push yourself too hard to where the wheels fall off. Try to make reasonable advancements so that you can uh, feel continue to feel passionate about it. You know, and for me, the time off gave me a ton of opportunity to work on things that I needed to work on. And I know, you know, you saw the Facebook out there. Some people took the time off. They didn't know jiu-jitsu. That's okay. But when you have the ability to do something, you should do it, in my, in my opinion. When I, when, I, when I wake up late, I look back and I say, man, I, I should have woken up early. I just lost the opportunity to do something. And, and, and you never get time back. So mm-hmm. – Use your time wisely is all I'm saying. You know, stop making excuses. Don't, you know, say, well, I got this, that, and the other thing. Make, make, put it in your schedule. For me, when I, and that's just me. When I put something on my schedule, I have to do it because I, I, I don't want to let myself down. And so when I make something tentative, like, oh, maybe I'll do that thing. Maybe I'll do it. Maybe I won't. A lot of times I don't do it. But if I put it on the schedule or for me, accountability, when I, post something online and I put something on Facebook, I got to do it now because I don't want to look liar. You know what I mean? And like when I was in the quarantine, I was over here lifting weights by myself. It was hard for me to get out there and do it by myself. But when I put myself on live video, I know nobody wants to watch anybody lifting weights for an hour. That's boring. I, I knew that. I but knew it was an was accountability piece. But it's accountability. So I know when I put that thing on, I got I got to do the workout. You know, there, there's no other option. So put yourself in a corner to where you have to do what you have to do to get to the goals that you want to get to. Don't give up. You know, keep working. Don't give up. And I love that you mentioned the the getting up late. Uh, not last Saturday, but the Saturday before did the same thing. I woke up two hours before I was going to. And I went, I'll go back to sleep. I have an alarm set. Well, I didn't have an alarm set. And I woke up three hours late. And I went, like, you, you can't have that time back. And it is an yeah. accountability piece. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So, you know, there, we only have so many hours in, in our lives. And, and if you're not where you want to be, it, all I'm saying is if you're not where you want to be in every aspect of your life and you might be where you want to be professionally, but maybe not healthy or maybe healthy, but not professionally or, you know, family wise or like right now, my dogs, I would rather train them. I want to spend more time training my dogs. So me working towards all my goals is getting to where I can check all of those off. And once I feel comfortable about all of those, maybe I'll sleep in a little, and then I'll find another goal. You know what I mean? Do you teach the dog sign language? I, I, I've i tried. I've tried. <laughs> um, they, they know a few. They know a few. They know a few. I can't, I can't claim that I'll make a video and, like, show anything spectacular, but one of my dogs knows sit, and that's – that's as close as I can say. That sit and down and a couple of those things. Yeah. But well, I've noticed this this motion for some reason makes most dogs sit, whether they know it or not. And it's the strange right? it's like right. the strangest thing ever. Right. <laughs> so in the last few minutes of you know, just talking about you're holding an imaginary treat in your hand. I think that's what it is. I think they just see yeah, that and they're, they're like, like, Oh, what's in there. I'll just sit and see what's in there. <laughs> yeah. 
you know. Reverse psychology. I got this. And then they don't trust you after you realize they realize you don't have a tree. No, sorry, I cut you off. No. <laughs> Listen, in the last episode, uh, I mean, <laughs> Bert talked for twelve minutes, and he goes, "Sorry if I took over your show." And I went, "That's why you're here." <laughs> <laughs> So well, I appreciate you having me on, man. It's awesome. And uh, I, I hope everyone comes out, watches the, the Jits King, and eventually come out and visit the gym, you know? Yeah, and I'll make sure to put, when it goes up and posted, you know, I'll put the address on there, Gracie Largo, you know, the times, everything. I know the Eventbrite link is on there. I think the tickets say they're $75, and they are limited. So anybody listening, you know, get them while you can. Hopefully, you know, I'm hoping it's going to be sold out. Just because this is a huge event, you know, we need to see how a tournament's going to run now. And I think the months of preparation and even, you know, I can see it behind you. It's it's not just talk. You have the squares laid out. You have the hygiene. You know, you have everything you need to keep everybody safe. And even the screenings, which is something we never thought we would do before. And yeah, it seems great. like, <laughs> you know, if you go to train, don't be sick. You know, plain yeah. and simple. And... I've learned that now, like, when you say, oh, I'm feeling sick, people don't go, ah, come on. Now they're like, okay, stay home. Stay, stay exactly. home. Exactly. It's changing. It's changing the, uh, the paradigm of everything. And, and that's, that's a good thing, at least. You know what I mean? Um, you, you shouldn't be selfish. You know, I mean, there's uh, people out there who say, hey, you know, freedom and all that. Freedom includes uh, looking out for everyone else. All right? You, should, you shouldn't be selfish. And that's all I have to say about that. No. And thank you for that, because that was perfect. Um, so, you know, the one and only Benjamin Zapata, I just like saying that, so <laughs> that's what it's going to see. So what I want you to do is, since you wanted to sign so much, could you sign Quiggin' Out MMA? All right, so I don't have a word for Quiggin' Out, but it's kind of like freaking out. So this is the letter Q. So I would say Quiggin' Out MMA podcast. Thank you very much for having me on your show. All right. Thank you so much. On behalf of Combat Press, who give me a platform, Epic Jits Tees for making a cool shirt. I'll have it on next week. And definitely, man, I'm really excited for you. Um, this is a huge moment, especially being a new gym owner, but not just a new gym owner, but, you know, being a professional, being proud of, you know, accomplishing your dream. Because I've known you for years, and you've always been saying, you literally would knock people out and go, okay, I want to... Can I can I open my gym now? Like this is what I want to do. This is what I want to get to. So now you finally got it. So congrats yeah, on that. Good. And you know, good luck on Saturday, man. Thank you, brother. I appreciate it. I hope you have a great evening and I'll see you soon. Thanks, man.